and my colleagues from the Sudeshi Jagran Manch, one of whom is Venkatesh who has written this book after enormous amount of thinking, discussions. In fact, I was wading through this book. He gave me an advanced copy to understand before I <coughs> stand before you so that I can see whether there is any relationship between what I am going to talk and what he has written. He's an intelligent man. So, a very substantial part of what he has written has to do with the title of the topic today, Life After Market. Mr. Radhakrishnan has been asking, he must have asked a hundred times <laughs> to repeat the talk which I gave some maybe ten years ago in C.P. Ramsamir Foundation on the rise and fall of communism. In fact, I was so afraid of repeating that uh, speech. It is like uh, what is known as in cricket, Solomon's throw. Those who are, have been seeing cricket for the last 40 years may have known about the tie test in Australia. The last four wickets fell without being able to score a run to win of Australia. In that, one square cut and the ball was on the boundary line and Solomon took that ball and threw the wicket down before he could run a single run. It was from there you could see only one stump. But he felled the stump with one throw and he was asked to repeat it hundred times, he could not do it later. <laughs> so I thought a speech so well appreciated should never be repeated because that appreciation will go. It so happens that the totality of the personality of a man gets delivered on one day, it may not get repeated on another day. So it is very difficult to repeat performances, especially when you are passionate about the subject which you talk. Because it is not merely an intellectual dis uh, display, it's not an intellectual exposition alone, it's something far more. So in the present situation, the topic that has been suggested, it's not my choice, this is the topic that has been suggested to me. Life after Marx and market. It rhymes well, but it is difficult to speak on it. You see, if you look back, till the day communism collapsed, no one knew it was collapsing. In fact, volumes have been written, maybe some 10,000 books have been written on this subject as to why communism collapsed. How a world standing on two poles became unipolar, one pole just disappeared. And in fact, one my friend Arun Shori once told me, and he was an empathizer of uh, communism, when I used to have discussions with him at one point in time. He used to tell me, Guru, it had all the potentialities of collapse, but I never thought it would collapse. <laughs> I asked him, how did you think it would not collapse when you saw the potentiality for collapse? I asked him, what is the potential you saw in it? He said, you look at the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall is built to see that nobody from the east crosses to the west. And it was not built by the west. It was built by the East to keep the, their own population in their own country. This showed the potentiality that it was waiting to collapse. And the history of communism, it's a very, it's not only an enlightening history, as a philosophy, it is not only a very exciting philosophy, 
it had a huge history behind it intellectual history philosophic history political history economic history cultural history religious history but all peculiar to only europe and christendom it had no experience of the outside world why communism could never understand the world is it was seeing the world only through the glass of christendom marx's friends and enemies his teachers and adversaries were found only in christendom in fact there are three dates which are very important in to understand marxism one is hegel who was the uh, some kind of a uh, dronacharya for marx from hegel marx took the philosophic analytical model for his communist thesis marx himself was almost a contemporary because uh, hegel lived between 1770 and 1831 and marx lived from 1818 to 1883 but hegel was the man who in essence we can say with some kind of uh, clarity today he was the one who confused the entire europe and his interpretation produced these as well as atheists so you can understand how confusing he was to interpret his philosophy was capable of interpretation wholly in the early sense it was capable of interpretation completely in the other worldly sense so his followers or his students got divided into two groups there was a left group and there was a right group even before communism came into being left and right had developed so marx was a product of that club which was the left thinking club at that time so much before marx leftist thought had come into being and what is the origin of this thought you may be surprised to know without a philosophy without a thought without a leader without an economic model in the year 1534 a communist revolution took place in the world in the city of munster in westphalia in germany in today's germany many of you may have been aware or may not have been aware i am not sure about anabaptists the anabaptists you know in the entire coast course, course of uh, european history there was one thought that was driving the whole intellectual academic political philosophic religious thinking in the in the west and this thinking was driving the world you will not believe till about the middle of last century and it is driving the world even today in the mind of many and that is the end of the world is imminent and when the end of the world occurs before that christ will come back and rule this world and we have to prepare the world for the return of christ this one single obsessive thought has driven the history of the entire europe so the anabaptists who were uh, protestant christians very rigid very frigid very committed absolutely religious very simple they decided that they saw a lot of wrong things going on in christianity the christians were not disciplined they were not religious they were not following the traditions that is why christ is not returning and so they decided to seize power and they seized power in 1534 believing that the return of christ is imminent but it is not occurring only because we are not good we are not good enough to call him back receive him back and they seized power and burnt all books other than bible enforced communal common ownership of property including women and polygamy because they felt anything about which you feel possessive 
delays the return of Christ. You need a world in which there is no possessive instinct at all. Everything should be common. Everything should be available to everybody. Nothing should be special to anyone, including his wife. And one year they ruled. And they ruled in this manner. There are any number of authorities to show that all that the communist philosophy, communist structure, communist organization derived was very largely in the revolutionary part of communism from Anabaptists who predated communism at least by three centuries and more. So you can understand that the tensions and turmoils which were let loose in the European history, which they say, in fact, I was looking at the, uh, browsing through the internet about the kind of deaths that have taken place in the last two millennia. More than 100 crore people have been killed and a very large number of deaths is why 99% of the killings have taken place because of the ideas, ideologies and philosophies which had emanated and got into power and position and influence from Europe. So it was a society of such unbearable tension, inner pain that produced this philosophy. And don't think it produced only that philosophy. This philosophy was a reaction to another philosophy. That was the capitalism, which that is how these ideological evolutions were taking place simultaneously, one as the reaction to the other. And my friend Professor Vardarajan used to say that the communism and capitalism are not opposites, but they are two sides of the same coin. In fact, it took me this he told me twenty years back when I was becoming a trespasser in economics. I began understanding the substance of what he was saying by analyzing what is the underlying philosophy of both. The underlying philosophy of communism and capitalism was one and the same. Both looked at the world only as a material phenomena. And both rejected the idea of God and divinity. Both concluded that human beings were just a bundle of wants and desires. And the only question is how to fulfill it. Capitalism would say, in fact somebody put it so beautifully, I think Noam Chomsky. He said that at the time the Chernobyl blast took place in Russia. Chomsky said the only difference between capitalism and communism is Communism will have Chernobyl at any cost. Capitalism will have it only if it yields profit. That's all the difference. If there is profit, there is capitalism. Even if there is no profit, there is communism. That's the difference. Otherwise, in their assessment of human beings, their history, their philosophy, their interrelationship, their sensitivities and sensibilities, there is absolutely no difference between the two. The only thing is, Capitalism knew how to live with the differences and allow people who die, who, 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 who have different views, to die a peaceful death. It's a gas chamber. But communism will kill them. That's the difference. Now one has collapsed. And there is no doubt it has collapsed though you see, nothing collapses completely. You go, you go and see all these Babylonian civilizations, there are still structures standing. So CPM will be there, CPA will be there. That doesn't mean the structures are there. <laughs> so collapse has taken place. Even they do not uh, probably say that uh, the world is going to rise up as a communist power, proletarian unity. All this is gone. Even the kind of capitalism they opposed is not there. The capitalism of today has nothing to do with the capitalism with Adam Smith probably conceived or which Marx opposed because 
there has been such a tectonic changes which have taken place in the character and the reach and the power of capitalism which has aroused the most basic element base element in the man that today it is difficult to say the same capitalism as a, it has retailed such an amount of asuric spirit in the society that it has taken such deep roots today it is difficult to say it is the same kind of communism which karl marx was supposing or the same kind of communism which many economists have conceived capitalism very many economists have conceived so the moment communism collapsed 1989-90 there was euphoria in the west because they didn't know why it collapsed but they wanted to appropriate the victory for the collapse so people began writing books and the books were written not as to acknowledge or to take credit for one of the forces which had won against the other it was on a very uh, high philosophic ground and again hegel was brought in hegel said the most perfect society is one where human beings feel that there is no further need for search for perfection and that is the highest and the most ideal state of a society so francis fukuyama one of the most acknowledged intellectuals of our times wrote a book end of history and last man and claimed that in the hegelian sense the perfect society is at hand only if the world is struggling to move forward and there will be competing forces there will be people to quarrel there will be fights and conflicts he said there is not going to be any such uh, situation and the whole world will be free of conflicts in fact he went to the extent of saying the history departments may have to close down because there will be no history of conflicts at all and you may be surprised to know this became the bible for globalization that the entire world will hereafter live without any kind of trouble any kind of mutual bickering quarrel we have reached an ideal state and what is the ideal state and he defined the ideal state to mean that the traditions of liberal democracy which the west had built has finally won against the rest and it is for the rest to follow the west as the best this was the simple theorem he expounded and all of us the rest of the world will have to condemn ourselves on the experience of 115th of the world and say that we have lived a bad life hereafter yours is the best we will accept and there is no alternative to it this was the arrogance with which the ideology for globalization was expounded in end of history and last man by francis fukuyama wto different global regimes washington consensus mrv has traced a lot of it in his book and the soul of the world becomes the high tower of capitalism that is america whatever america said or did was fit enough to be followed by the rest of the world and this was the extent to which the power of modern capitalism rose democracy modern capitalism market economics were all the three dimensions of the same phenomenon that is based on individualism individualism that has gone to the extent of completely destroying families communities and you know what is happening in the west today all that the high philosophy of individualism which has been assiduously built as an alternative structure for the world to rest on that has completely destroyed the family life there no one was willing to look in because the what the west was saying was right and doing was right and we have to do something likewise in order to survive in the world is what was being constantly fed to the rest of the world with the result no one was willing to even critically examine that the west is collapsing faster than communism was seen to do yes communism was seen to be in difficulties in the 80s 
In fact, there was a debate in America when, when Ronald Reagan was the Prime Minister for the President. There was a debate in America as to whether America should go to the aid of Russia and say, See, communism cannot survive without our help. This would be a benevolent approach. At the same time, we can prove our point that we are the victors. Because if the fellow who has been fighting against us is going to come to us with a begging bowl and we put some money, and that is an acknowledgement enough. But ruthless as they are, and rightly so, because both are ruthless and you can't expect one to be compassionate. They said, nothing do we. Let them collapse, let them die and die at our feet. This was the debate that was going on in America. You know, what was the mechanism they devised for this? If you are already in difficulties and you are competing with me, and you can't compete with me, you don't have the financial power to compete with me, I will make you spend more. And so they conceived the idea of Star Wars. They did not spend one rupee on Star Wars. But they said, we will commit one trillion dollar for Star Wars. One trillion dollar? Where will Russia go? So Russia had to mount its own counter to Star Wars. With the result, what the Russians could not do, they attempted to do. And a collapse which would have taken place three decades from now, took place within a decade. So you can understand how global powers target each other, because both are acquisitive powers, strong powers, ruthless powers and the fundamental difference between the two is one says there has to be individualism but collectivized under the state where the state will disappear ultimately all individuals will live happily like our Krita Yuga communism began with Kali Yuga and tried to end up in Krita Yuga a stateless society where everybody is happy, no policemen are needed, no prime minister is needed. The world doesn't need a government. This is the extent to which the theoretical exposition of communism took the world to and made the world believe. But we knew from our experience that we have moved away from Krita Yuga into Kali Yuga. You have to understand this, the world is a tough world. So we made our people practical. If, if our people are in difficulties, they know they have to be in difficulties and they have to tackle these difficulties. But communism did the reverse. You need not have to be in difficulty. See the world we are projecting to you. See the consequence of it. The amount of death and destruction this ideology caused by blinding the world to believe that it is taking them to uh, utopia on this earth. With that chapter over. And the victors claiming, yes, we have won. What is the victory that was claimed? The victory was that liberal democracy and market capitalism have won the war against autocracy and economic dictatorship. Political autocracy and economic dictatorship have been defeated by liberal democracy and market capitalism. This is the most important part of globalization. There is a theoretical or philosophic basis for the globalization about which you are all talking, our media is talking, our economists are talking, our finance ministry is talking, or any finance ministry is talking, without understanding what is being talked. When we are talking about capitalism, we are not talking about foreign investment. When we are talking about globalization, we are not talking about exports or foreign trade. We are talking about something far more serious and profound. And unless you understand the criticality of the situation, you will not be able to appreciate the risk and the dangers inherent in this argument. And when they said that it is end of history and the rest of the world will have to follow the West, the entire world was looking at America as the final destination and it was the beginning and it was the initiator, it was the decider and it was the concluder of any meeting. And almost every nation which was not in the market capitalist orientation had lost its confidence including India. There was a time when I used to move with the top industrial families in this family, in, in this country. I used to talk to them very intensely about what they were feeling. And the 
finance ministry officials of the government of india used to advise the indian families large families large industrial groups it is better for you to sell your manufacturing units today otherwise you will have to sell it as scrap tomorrow it is much better you sell them and become traders which is one of which is our prime avocation 300 years back we were great traders let us go into trading let americans do the manufacturing this was being talked in the south block and north block so you can understand the the depths to which our confidence or any country's confidence had fallen in those days wireless internet communication american economy going at 8% and everybody wanting to go to america not only in india in russia in germany in france in uh, in china this was the world unfolding was fukuyama right has it become the final victory of the west over the rest everything turned on one day that was 9th of september 2001 when the islamic terrorists hit not any other thing but the world trade center which was the symbol of capitalism they never knew economics they don't understand what is capitalism or communism they only understood islam and quran they did nothing else what is it that made them target what is the symbol of capitalism modern capitalism they didn't target an economic ideology they didn't target a materialist philosophy they targeted the universalism of the west the western idea was always in the powers including the tallest power in the world that there is something in india which we have missed out and we also missed out because we were only carbon copying their ideas their textbooks their language their idiom and their way of looking at india and whatever was bad in their eye in india is also bad in our eyes if this is the assessment on which we were we were judging india so you have to concede to the foreigners foreign scholars foreign philosophers foreign historians foreign economists foreign politicians as to why they have missed out india how did they miss out india see when capitalism was on the rise and the western nations had completely overtaken asian nations asian nations means you must at that point judge only india and china most populous nations great powers great civilizations and uh, we had the software to run the world and these nations had fallen apart fallen down in the scale of the world and so max weber he wrote that you know the modern capitalism which is, capitalism which is developing is a product of christianity protestant christian ethic hinduism and buddhism which believe in karma and rebirth will be destroyed in that capitalist mode of economy they have no way of even copying it you don't have even the dna which will enable you to copy this model and survive you can't even survive this was his conclusion in the year 1920 and i don't mind some weber in in germany writing a book and concluding which is not even trans was not even translated into english till sometime 1954 i think but it became the bible for our own social reformers our own economists our own developmental thinkers our own politicians our own media our own intellectuals that the belief in karma and rebirth under the caste system of india has have done india in and unless india disowns all these that is unless india disowns itself there is no way india could develop and match and become something worth calling itself in the world this was the economic theory that was being bombarded in the indian educational institutions media day in and day out the problem of india is not economic the problem of india is this society of india the problem of india is the culture of india 
problem of India is the tradition of India. The problem of India is India. This was how India was being convinced. And by our own people, if the West joined, it's strategic for them. Maybe it is even real for them. It is in their interest. But for 50 years, this nation's confidence was destroyed by our own leadership, our own people, our own intellectuals, our own economists, our own policy makers. That we survived through all this and for what reason now we are being accepted in the world and seen not only as a rising economic power, but also as a political power, a cultural power, a soft power. Call any idiom in the language of the West, you are being seen as a positive manifestation of that. And the world is beginning to see India because India's rise is making them feel. And unless there is something very innate, something very intrinsic, something which is matching with the soul of India in its very exterior, India will not be rising. And volumes are being written about our rise today. I would personally trace this rise to one event, like one non-economic event, trans-economic event, which had nothing to do with the principles of economies or globalization or dollar or anything completely destroyed the confidence of America, namely the 9-11 attack on America. There is one non-economic event which completely transformed the confidence levels of India and that is the poker and atomic blast. You trace the rise of India, the zero date will be that. The world had decided to destroy India on that day. The world had decided to destroy India on that there was absolutely no doubt because the finance ministry officials were livid at that decision. In fact, the finance secretary in those days decided to resign. He is now the planning commission vice chairman. He said, this government has destroyed India. Every country worth the name pounds on India, even an important Japan which doesn't have even a rifle to shoot us. They are spending 60 billion dollars as, as, as military expense. They don't have a single soldier because they pay that check to America for them to protect them. So you can understand the, 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 uh, the state of the country as a power. You may have 11 trillion dollars uh, bank, uh, bank savings, but that doesn't mean anything unless you have an army, unless you have power, unless you have power in the sense in which the rogues on the street will be afraid of you. So, whole world pounced on India. The whole world was looking how this crisis India will tackle. This is where the whole world began to have a different feel of India. The non-resident Indians, who always used to abuse India, in fact, uh, one uh, advertisement expert, she wrote an article in Economic Times, Tarasina, in the year 2000 or 2001, if you remember right, where she said, as a, as a global executive, I always used to travel throughout the world, but being a person brought up in very traditional surroundings, I never used to go to hotels, I always used to stay in the houses of my friends. And the way they used to abuse this country, it's a rotten country, it's a dirty country, it's a corrupt country, see the traffic, see the... 20 million Indians abusing India day in and day out. And you have 500 IFS officers to talk good about India if they want to. So you can understand the imbalance about how much opinion was being generated against this country and how a helpless government which only teaches the AFS officers how to take drinks with the western countries, they can't be the cultural ambassadors to defend India. A country and a civilization, a culture, a tradition completely undefended in the world. The government issued an appeal to the non-residents. All, we are in trouble. Please help us. They wanted five billion dollars 
At that time, our foreign exchange reserve was comfortable. But any run on the foreign exchange reserve, because we don't know what the West could do. They could do anything to trigger a collapse. They did it in, in, in uh, Russia, they did it in Yugoslavia, they did it in uh, Eastern economies. They could do it in India. And they would have done it if India had gone for convertibility. They would have finished India with the atomic blast. If India had taken a decision on convertibility and then gone for atomic blast, we would have been finished as a country. We had a policy safeguard of non-convertibility of the currency and so they could do a damn. They could not do anything. They could only bring in money, they could not take it out. And when we wanted 5 billion dollars, the non-resident Indian gave us 6.2 billion dollars when no one would think of investing even 1 dollar in India at that time. You know, the West watches all this. No one would have put one dollar in Indian economy at the time. Its country risk was so high. Nobody wanted to invest one dollar. They invested, sunk 6.2 billion dollars. That means each must have thought, let my money go. But my pride has been aroused today. This was the turning point. And now we are looking at market economy. Life after market. Most people cannot understand how market functions in India. 98% of the Indian businesses are family owned. We read it somewhere, but we don't connect it to any other thing. Today I was addressing a seminar on corporate governance. How foolish we are as a society. Some intelligent community like the Chartered Accountant community, what is it discussing about? What is corporate governance? These are supposed to be amongst the most intelligent people in the country. Leaving me out, I am saying Venkatesh or Prabhakar or whatever. <laughs> because some of the best minds entered the Chartered Accountants profession, even now they do it because that is the only place where you can go without reservation. <laughs> so, when they went in, became such acceptedly intelligent people. What is corporate governance? When I, I, I didn't have an opportunity to read it. I did some research for 2-3 hours yesterday and found that the reason why this idea of corporate governance generated itself in Western countries, particularly in America and UK, no other Western country, is that the American companies have no owner. Because all the shares in the company are owned by investment institutions. There is nobody called a promoter. There is no data. Except for there is no other owner. And so they find that the shareholders are not represented at all. It is the CEO who is the top man. And he can do anything. And he colludes with the few investment institutions, defrauds the company, and there is no answer to it. A new situation has developed where you have huge $500 billion company which has no owner. They said some principles of governance is needed to supply the omission or supply the vacuum that has been caused by the disappearance of the owner. And so the corporate governance, this structure was conceived in the last few years. It is not that it has happened 20 years back. We are now discussing it. We are now wanting to bring it in. But here we have a promoter. We have a owner. Here the problem is the conflict of interest between owners and others. Nothing of that kind is being discussed. We are also discussing about corporate governance in the same sense in which America is discussing, as if we don't have owners. This is the extent to which our brains have been mortgaged completely. Small example I am giving you. And this is the work of a community. This is the work of lawyers, this is the work of media, this is the work of chartered accountants, this is the work of bureaucrats. These are all supposed to be great thinkers. Intelligent people. But see the extent to which we have become, we have ceased to be thinkers for ourselves. We don't even know about ourselves. We don't even hold a mirror before ourselves to see whether what kind of human being we are. What kind of an animal we are. We don't understand. So much of self-forgetfulness has come into the system, in the thinking, in the structures, in the approaches to others, that 
a huge difference was made for the first time and today india is being seen and what is the impact of india's rise particularly to the concept of market the market in the west and market in india have nothing to do with each other even family is a market there family obligations are outsourced a woman can outsource the burden of getting a child to another woman today sperms are being sold but nobody knows which children is born to who gay rights gay marriages are going on and the market that has ever developed is based on these principles a son has to compete with the father a mother has to compete with the daughter there is nothing like a father being respected by the son or a teacher being respected by a teacher has to compete to win the respect of the child you know how difficult it is we have been students can a teacher win the respect by competing with the student competition has taken roots in such severe fashion everywhere today the american government is why the entire western system is bearing the burden of transference of responsibilities from all the intermediary institutions like the family the community and all these informal institutions which govern which uh, which in a way sustain and what professor vardarajan called as the institutions of dharma they sustain the society and the entire responsibility which is managed by these dharmic institutions or the idea of dharma have been transferred to the state in america through the market in fact there was a dialogue in which once i said india is perhaps the most privatized economy in the world because the largest public burden of the people in the west countries in the west namely the social security burden has been nationalized in western countries and it is privatized in india thanks to the principles of dharma responsibility of taking care of the parents the brothers the sisters the unemployed sons daughters extended families imagine these responsibilities are to fall upon the government can the government in india run for one day not speaking about the financial burden it has to face the entire revenue of the government of india will not be sufficient to keep these people free of hunger by two square meals a day so the market here has a is a very different market it is not based on individualism and so when we are talking about market after market Uh, uh, what after ma- ma- market and marx what is the market we are talking about it is not the market in the western sense of the term it is our sunday in fact if i remember once uh, when i was in the discussions in the center for policy studies they told me i think it is in murshidabad where uh, the sunday was meeting and uh, there were no trees there were not many trees and so the british authorities at that time the east india company authorities came and planted people tree there people tree plants so the sandai people who used to assemble there they began assembling in another place they said where are you not assembling we have planted the trees only for you people and you are leaving even the little shade available here and going and doing your uh, transaction somewhere else sir our tradition is we can't tell lies in front of the people tree <laughs> no no civilization can understand this today i had made ex- some of my friends assisting i had made a very extensive study of the community system in india i am just revealing one thing and with which i'll see the differ- differential between the market here and market there is communicated and with that i will close as which market will win market will win but which market will win there are two communities strong communities in coimbatore and i was talking to a very leading industrialist belonging to one community 
I asked him, I saw his balance sheet, you have nearly 1000 crores of surplus cash in your balance sheet. Why don't you there buy, there are many companies available here, why don't you buy those companies? Why don't you buy those companies? Why don't you buy those companies? Sir, sir, you can buy your company. அடுத்த கம்யூனிட்டியில் இருக்கிறவங்க கம்பெனியை வாங்கலாமே இல்லை சார் ரெண்டு சமுதாயத்துக்குள்ள அனாவசியமாக தகராறு வந்துடும் சார் கேன் யூ சி இன் த இன்ஃப்ளூன்ஸ் ஆஃப் த சொசைட்டி ஆன் த மார்க்கெட் இன் அதர் கண்ட்ரிஸ் தி மார்க்கெட் ஃபோர்சஸ் வில் டிஸ்ட்ராய் தீஸ் கம்யூனிட்டிஸ் தே ஹேவ் டிஸ்ட்ராய் ஹியர் த கம்யூனிட்டி ரெஸ்ட்ரெயின்ட் இஸ் டிசிப்ளினிங் த மார்க்கெட் ஃபோர்சஸ் No regulatory mechanism can provide for this. It's only the society which can do it. The role of the society in sustaining the Indian economy. As everyone studied, the Indian system. I always used to repeat it. I have told this in University of Los Angeles, to the IIT of Midras, to the IIM of Bangalore, and I have told this to 100 audiences. For 7 lakh villages in India, we have only 12,404 police stations. You see the depth of the social discipline in this country and you trivial in this country as a violent country, as a rotten country. No other country can live with such minimalist police force. We don't need police. What is the reason? The reason is what this lady who spoke here as the invited entrepreneur to speak. How when her child was reading, without knowing his subjects, she was just sitting by his side to see that he is supported psychologically. You can't find one mother in America like that. You can't find one industrialist like the whom, in fact I forgot to tell you, I spoke to another leading industrialist belonging to another community, the other community, and he gave me the same answer. This is not what educational institutions in India teach us. So the market that will survive is the market that was always with the human beings from the time that human beings began talking about economics. But not the barbaric market that the West is trying to hawk through the world. That market has to be destroyed. Even if it is not, it contains seeds of destruction. I don't want to go into the financial... Uh, implications which uh, MRV has brought out so beautifully in his book. Anyone who reads his book will come to the conclusion that even if the whole world wants and prays to the only God which they want us to believe in, this system will not be sustainable. A country which says you borrow money and spend don't worry about whether you will return the money back or not. If that country is going to lead the world and decide policies and say how other countries should behave, you can understand. For the 10th, 11th year in succession, America is only borrowing money and their total borrowings is over 7 trillion dollars today. So the crisis is real. Crisis for market is real. The crisis for the western market is real, but the people tree market will continue to exist. Thank you very much.